Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz drummer, arranger, composer, and educator Jeff Hamilton. We caught up with him on July 8th, 2020 during the COVID-19 swirl to talk about his latest 2020 CD with his trio, Catch Me If You Can. He spent quite a while in the world of jazz recording or performing with his trio, Oscar Peterson, Ray Brown, the Clayton Brothers, and he's done so much more. He teaches, arranges, and composes. He's a busy cat. Get to know him. Hi, Joe. Thanks for the call. Oh, man. Thanks for taking some time out. I'm a big fan. Sure. Well, I, that's something i got plenty of right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that all ironically plays in me being a fan this time. The title of your album, Catch Me If You Can, I guess it finally happened. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk, I want to talk to you a couple of different ways about this album. First of all, from an artistic perspective, and second, during a pandemic, an album coming out. So First and foremost, it's a great album, as usual. Talk to me about the artistic approach to this project. Well, with uh, the addition of John Hamer, which uh, would have been his first, is his first project with a trio, um, I wanted his input on, on what he wanted to bring into the book. And uh, he'd been in the trio for about a year and a half. And he's, he's a good composer and arranger, and he understands what the trio's about, uh, three equal parts. So uh, I welcomed uh, his uh, creative uh, entries into the book, which uh, are two originals, and uh, they, of course, uh, feature him, which is a policy in the trio. If you want to be featured, you better come up with your own arrangement. Nobody else is going to write it for you. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he did that and uh, did another arrangement of uh, an Artie Shaw uh, old standby theme, uh, Moon Ray. So... Uh, that was one of the things I wanted to do was introduce him into the trio. And, um, and of course, Tim, Tamir Handelman has been in the trio 21 years. So, uh, his compositions and arranging skills are, are, uh, well known by any, any fan of the trio. And I wanted to, I, we needed an up tempo, uh, tune. And, uh, and he came up with that, uh, one of those impossible to play Tamir Handelman arrangements. And we eventually got it. And uh, it was appropriately titled Catch Me If You Can. So, and so we decided that was a good title track for the CD. Uh, and um, I've been getting a lot of funny reports of people saying, I got the CD, I guess I caught you, you know. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> I'm an easy target sitting around at this time, so uh, it's easy to catch me. Well, so that was the creative of- process for for the most part. Oh. Cre- that's the creative process. I. I uh, I just wanted to play some some material that maybe isn't as well known, but I've always loved, like the Big Dipper from you know growing up with the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band playing to that every day uh, as a teen, and um, uh, uh, things like um, Helen's song, which is a, a George Cable's tune that I play with him every July at a jazz camp, and I, I just that's one of those tunes I can't get out of my head, and I wanted to to put our sort of uh, uh, treatment on that and um, and then Make Me Rainbows, which starts off the album. But I learned that from Mike Wofford and Holly Hoffman on a CD I did of Holly's. And uh, man, that's another melody. It's just, I just can't get out of my mind. So that's how the album kind of came together. We just, we just came up with tunes as every album is, which is that we love to play. And, and let's, uh, as Ray Brown said, you play someone else's material, make sure you put a new dress on it. So that's that's kind of what our trio is about. How about this coming out during a pandemic when people have more time to listen to it, but you can't do any of this live? What have been your feelings? Well, it was uh, my idea to put it out early uh, because, first of all, we were going to have it out like uh, the end of February, you know, beginning of March, and... Uh, Capri Records felt like maybe we should wait and see, you know, see what happens with all of this. And as time was going on, and it looked like there wasn't too much uh, hope in it coming out by the, it coming out of the pandemic by summer. I said, you know, people have a lot of time to sit around and listen. Let's let let's put this up on our Instagram and Facebook site and buy direct from the company and see what happens. And I think we sold sixty the first day just from that Instagram, the, the record company did. So it's kind of been out. It's kind of a soft release. And now I understand, uh, of course, now, obviously, that radio stations have it, and I'm getting some requests for uh, for interviews. And uh, so I, I guess it's officially out now. It's kind of a, it's a weirdest release I think I've ever been a part of. Well, it's, it's, it's the weirdest time on the planet that I've, I can ever even imagine. So I guess it just plays into that. 
cauldron. So, yeah. Yeah, why should know? it be any different? <laughs> right. Exactly. So speaking of this surreal time, this David Lynch movie we're all ma- making our way through, when in early... <laughs> <laughs> when, well in early to, yeah, like, when in early to mid-March did you realize everything was coming to a halt? Kind of how did your itinerary get hosed? Well, I, um, I first of all, I'd had a couple of gigs with jazz societies, and their board uh, of directors got together and said, man, I don't know how this is going to go. Let's uh, cancel the whole season through September, which I thought was a little premature. Uh, on their part, and then there was a, a jazz society who waited until two weeks before the gig. Uh, we're going to play the end of March, and and they they pulled the plug. I think this, the beginning of the second week of March, and that kind of leaves you high and dry. And I had I had a, a bunch of I was supposed to be a guest at Michigan State in residence for a week, and and that board of directors decided it wasn't uh, a good idea to go on. And so so when people start letting you know that they're canceling jobs that's that's when the, the the red flag goes up but i i was hopeful that some of these things would continue uh early on without knowing how how serious this thing was going to get so the last gig i played actually was march 6th uh here in la with graham decker and uh tamir and uh alex frank of basis so so that was my last gig, March 6th. And the next one is February 2021, the way it looks. When we do return, say in February after the first year, whenever that happens in full force, what do you hope both musician and audience gets from this time away from live music? Well, I think I think we're all experiencing experiencing it now with uh, missing the what what we have been used to hearing and and playing. Uh, I think audiences, I've talked to Wynton Marsalis about this, and, and uh, he hopes that uh, that by by having all these online virtual concerts that people are realizing is that while they're still good to hear the musicians play, that there's nothing like sitting in a live audience hearing the, the musicians create. This, this, is, this is one of the things that, you know, is tough for watching these virtual things because jazz is in elements are are uh, interplay and spontaneity and when you're in a room by yourself playing your part you know that's that's not easy to do with somebody else uh, <laughs> miles away from you so i think the hunger is building for the audience to uh to, to come back and be a part of this uh and certainly the musicians are going crazy you know i mean the, every, every friend that i've talked to is like man i just can't wait to get back and play i saw matt wilson with ken, ken poplowski from smalls a couple of days ago and there was so much joy in their playing. It was like, man, you know, we, we really, and they actually said, we really needed this. So, um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that everybody's going to be hungry enough to, to, to go out and, and hear the music. The problem is the social distancing and if the venues can figure that out. So, uh, but I, all I can do is my part, which is keep playing, keep working on stuff. I'm doing a lot of homework during this time off listening to, Jimmy Lunsford and Fletcher Henderson, and you know, going way back and hearing some historic things that that you don't get early on, and certainly don't learn in college. So, I'm uh, I, that's what I'm spending my time on is doing my own, building my own curriculum for what what I want to play when I get back on the bandstand. So I'll, at least I'll do my part, but I I can't I can't tell the venues what to do. You know, during this absence, you know, you've had a lot of moments on stage throughout the years. You've been all over the world. Are there any magic moments, any specific memories that are kind of keeping you optimistic during this time, this absence away from the stage? Well, I get constant reminders uh, from people who say, you know, they ask me in an interview or, uh, you know, they'll call me up after I do an online lesson or an online master class and they'll bring up a recording and I'll listen to it, you know, to prepare for the master class or whatever. And, and all the memories start flooding back from uh, uh, that particular recording or that tour. And so I'm getting constant reminders. But the, I guess the biggest, uh, uh, the two biggest uh, points were, were in uh, the Montreux Jazz Festival in July of 76 when uh, Monty Alexander, John Clayton, and I were the throwaway band on a night sandwich between Bad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra and Stan Getz Quartet. 
and uh, we were placed in the middle, and and we ripped into uh, you know Monty started off an intro on Night Miss Blues, and everybody sat down, and it was like, uh oh, we got something here, and then that became the recording Montreal Alexander, which was the second recording I was ever on, and it was an out of body experience because the if, you know if you're familiar with that record, the audience is clapping throughout and standing up and. <laughs> And uh, yeah. it was uh, it felt it was very unreal to play that night. I felt like somebody else was playing the drums, and I was watching it happen. And uh, the second one would be my first night at uh, the Hollywood Bowl with Oscar Peterson and Ray Brown and eighteen thousand people. And uh, July seventh, actually nineteen ninety. So uh, we're missing it by a few, you know a little bit of days here, but. Um, those are the two. I think those are the two biggest points where it's like there were just goosebumps the entire time uh, on the bandstand. You know, everyone has their perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? Uh, I think I'm somebody who set some goals and worked hard to attain the goals and play with the people that I wanted to play with and stuck to my guns about the music that I love to play. I play the drums the way I believe they should be played based on uh, being fortunate with uh, having the right guidance from the proper teachers and uh, knowing me and knowing the information I needed uh, that they could they could provide me to, to set that path for what I wanted. And then, as I mentioned before, building my own curriculum by by getting all the recordings of everyone I wanted to play with and learning every drummer that played with them and transcribing them and eventually meeting the likes of Ed Thigpen and Shelly Mann and Jay Canna and, and Philly Joe Jones and, and figuring out what I needed to do uh, to get to that point. So I, you know, I've, I've stuck to my guns about the music I love to play and I only play music with people that I love to play with or, you know, I'm not, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm over those days of, Oh, I got to play with this guy cause they're great or this person or this, this, uh, you know, this vocalist. And, and it's, it's like, now everybody has to get along on the bandstand and we got to be there to serve the music and, you know, the egos have to be set aside. So I just, I think it, I've made it work with, um, with having a 38, year marriage and a wife that's understanding of, of I have to do this for, for a living. It's all I've ever wanted to do. It's all I can do. And I guess that kind of sums up that, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm very happy that uh, I've gotten to play the music and be able to be out and, and share this with uh, other musicians and people who, who love the music. Great answer. Beautiful. Jeff, thank you for taking some time out for Neon Jazz. Thank you for the music. Good luck with this album and stay safe out there. All right, Joe, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. We're all in this together. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jeff for his time, class, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time. Go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.